This is part five in a series of videos in which I'm developing a magnetic core memory system and I'll be making the bare boards available as a kit of parts and this series is also to promote a book I'm about to release that details this um, development in a lot of detail. I'll be going over quite a lot of detail in the videos but of course um, most of it will be in the book and I won't be duplicating all of the information uh, but hopefully there will be enough in these videos to make them interesting. One of the problems in trying to demonstrate systems like this and especially going through the development of them is that there's a lot of interdependent circuits that all need to work together and although in this video I had intended to go on to the sense amplifier design what I've decided to do instead, partly in response to some questions that have been asked, is just to go into the system engineering a bit more. I won't go into it in too much depth, it won't get too boring, but I uh, just wanted to cover a few points. Now the first one is, whenever you develop a system like this, uh, what we have here is a fairly heavy mixture of uh, analog power control circuits, sensitive analog detection circuits and TTL logic and as I went over in the previous video the uh, driver circuits to drive current through the core wires uh, are full bridge circuits now they're controlled through a series of TTL gates and one of the things you have to be very careful of when you design a system like this is TTL devices when you power them up, as the voltage rails increase, it might be only be a few microseconds, but as the voltage comes up, their outputs are undefined, so the uh, functions, the function of the IC will not be um, maybe as you expect it to be. And because if you're controlling something like a bipolar transistor, as we are here on the output of those gates, then if the output on the gate should be zero, but happens to exceed 0.5 volts or so as the power comes up, which it may well do, then that transistor will turn on. And in this case, because we have, uh, as I say, a full bridge circuit, if we turn both halves on at the same time, we effectively um, put a short circuit across the power supply rails. We have 16 of these circuits in this system, and so 16 short circuits across the power supply is going to prevent the system from booting up. And then of course because you've got a short circuit across the power supply it prevents the voltage rising high enough for the TTL devices to start working properly. There are various ways around this. The easiest way is to have a separate supply for the two halves. The only problem doing that is uh, in a, a system like this is I wanted to keep a single supply so that kind of it wasn't really an option for me here. So what I did instead was to uh, have a gate interface uh, control between the TTL and the uh, analog drivers. And what that really means is that if you think about it, each of these 16 circuits uh, has two inputs from the control logic, one for the read and one for the write cycle. And that means there are 32 control lines coming from the TTL uh, decoder system. And so all I have here is a single uh, set of gates, that's four gates, that are used to effectively gate all of those signals. And this red wire that you can see snaking around here, you can see I've modified the chip so I can demonstrate this. Um, if this device is just put in without any form of control uh, then what will happen is if you try and power the board up it will just appear as a dead short across the power supply but with this system in place then um, it effectively gives a one second startup delay before any of the bridge circuits can be made active so in other words it allows plenty of time for the TTL to do its thing and settle down before any of the uh, bridge circuits are allowed to turn on and this is what I've been doing here is just testing that this works so there is a, uh, a reset control circuit on the board uh, that times the boot up and uh, prevents um, this unwanted situation of shorts across the supply 
And that's something that you need to consider whenever you design any system, but in particular one where you have uh, a mixture of uh, technologies, uh, and in particular something like TTL logic and bipolar transistors are something you need to be very careful with. One other point um, that came up as a result of some of the questions on the previous video was one of scalability. So what do you do if you want to scale a system like this up? And I think there may be a bit of misunderstanding somewhere along the line here as to uh, how you'd go about scaling this up. I perhaps haven't explained it very well. In this system we're using um, 64 cores uh, per word or per byte and that gives us a total of 64 bytes of memory when we're done. If you want to scale this up then all you would do is you would increase the number of X or Y lines and because we've got a total of six um, then that's the address lines then when you split those into two groups you have two groups of three lines that allows you to decode those two groups into two sets of eight bits so it's, you can go from three bits on the address line to one of eight for the X and one of eight for the Y and that means you just need eight wires for the X and eight wires for the Y but those wires are common for all the mats so each of these squares of uh, cores is a mat this uh, card will store uh, 64 8 bit bytes and the X naught line goes through every single mat so it's not a separate X line for each mat there's a single X line goes through every single mat and a single Y naught line goes through every single mat as well so there are only uh, 16 wires not including the inhibit sense wires uh, on this particular uh, card although there appears to be more wires it's because of the way they have to be interconnected um, but in terms of conduction paths there are only 16 so of course if you want to scale it up all you do is you increase the number of wires but uh, you get an increasing return each time you do that because you have uh, higher numbers in the X and Y direction for your grid and because we have 16 wires we have 16 drivers and so it's as simple as that. There's, we, you don't need a massive number um, of driver circuits. You need quite a large number, but um, although we're storing 512 bits in this system, uh, we only need 16 drivers. So I hope that made some sense. So what I'm going to look at here is, um, you would have noticed in the previous video, and I was trying to demonstrate the, uh, the way we control the core, that the signals on the scope were very noisy, and that's uh, unfortunately one of the issues trying to do this on breadboards. With this type of system you can only go so far. Well I did develop the entire system on breadboards. The signals are very noisy so I had to take that into account during development but it's very difficult to try and explain it um, in a video like this so I've decided to use uh, an actual uh, prototype board here for some of the demonstrations. What I want to demonstrate here is part of what I've just been um, talking about which is the principle of operation for a system like this. So we have uh, 16 wires but we only ever energize two of those at once if we disclude or discount the inhibit line. So we're talking here about the selection lines. So it will be one of the X lines somewhere X0 to X7 but only one of them and the one of the Y uh, wires Y0 to Y7 but only ever one at a time um, so what we have to do is decode the incoming address that's been selected into two 1 of 8 um, values which is what part of the decoder does which I'll go into in a separate video but in this video what I want to do is just demonstrate how this works in practice so I have this board hooked up, I've got the address line set all to zero, that allows us to select the two drivers that I've populated, and uh, I have the chip select and the read write line set to put us into a mode that allows the system to go through a full cycle. And again I'll come back to this in a future video, but the read write um, for the overall system is not the same as the read write for the core. Uh, whether you 
read the memory from the host system perspective or write the memory the internal cycles for the core memory system are the same that is it is always a read followed by a write and uh, again I'll go into that in more detail in a future video but it's um, important to remember that there's a sequence of events that occur irrespective of whether you're writing to this memory or reading from it so what we have in the bottom right hand corner of the board is a couple of uh, ICs that generate the sequence of signals required to drive this memory system uh, I also had a, a comment asking what the interface type was um, whether it was a data bus, address bus, that sort of thing and if you're familiar with uh, core memory systems you'll know that quite often there's a very complex uh, interface required for them with lots of multiple uh, timing requirements and it gets very uh, difficult to drive them and I wanted to avoid that with this system uh, the book goes into a lot of detail on this but in short I've created an interface that makes the entire um, system look like an SRAM so it has an address bus bi-directional data bus um, chip enable and a read write line and power lines and that's it so you can um, drive it as if though it's an SRAM and there's also some circuitry on here that will automatically trigger um, a read or write cycle if uh, any of the inputs change so it saves you having to explicitly tell the core memory to, to do a read or a write um, there's also some jumpers on here you can't see them the behind this connector but it allows you to put it into a manual mode where uh, you can uh, use an external trigger pulse to start the read or write process and then it will do a read or write depending on the state of the uh, read write control line and I've got it set to manual mode at the moment so there's two jumpers you need to move and so I can control it from the uh, signal generator which is what I'm doing here signal generator is set to give a one microsecond pulse and it's doing that at a, a frequency of one kilohertz so we'll be uh, triggering this memory system um, at a rate of one kilohertz it's all set up ready to go so I'll power it up or if that's already powered up I'll now switch on the signal generator and what we can see now is the green trace is the uh, input to the system that's the trigger poles from the signal generator the yellow trace is the output from the sense wire so we saw this in the previous uh, video and uh, what we're looking at here is this second hump is the uh, output from the sense wire when the core flips magnetization state now at the moment it's always flipping state you can see as um, the uh, pulse is applied the current will be rising and when it reaches a certain point it causes the uh, core to flip state this spike over here is there's a second um, phase to this process as I said it's a two-step process a read and a write uh, this is the uh, other part of that process and you can see here there's another spike where the core flips back and this is the read write two-step process that we have for this system I'll come back to that mechanism in a later video but for now we're interested in this portion here and in the previous video I said I was driving a single wire in the little board I have with the core and I was driving twice the current through the X wire only what I'm doing now is driving both the X and the Y wires so each one is carrying half the critical current required to cause the core to flip so if I leave the system running but I disconnect the Y wire you'll see that although we're still getting uh, this initial pulse caused by the um, current flowing through the X wire we can see that the signal return from the sent wire has disappeared if I reconnect this you can see it reappears if I disconnect it you can see it's gone again so uh, what's happening here is that if a single wire is energized we don't get uh, any transitions in the core magnetization state if two wires that pass through the same core 
are energized then we get a sufficiently strong field to cause to cause the core to energize unless of course the inhibit wire was passing current in the other direction if the inhibit wire is passing current in the opposite direction to either of the X or the Y wires then it's effectively the same as me unplugging this wire because it negates uh, one of the two currents so that's what we need to be looking at next is detecting this uh, secondary pulse and so in the next video we will look at the uh, circuit to detect and amplify this pulse and we'll also look at the uh, decoding and how we turn the address uh, that's fed into the uh, card into the two signals required to drive the X and the Y wires. Okay so as you can see this is only a partly assembled board and um, over the next few videos I will go through and I'll fully populate this board. I have built several of these to test them but uh, we'll go through this step by step and uh, hopefully as we go through it um, it will all become clear as to how this works and um, I can fully demonstrate um, uh, how to hook it up and use it. I would say there is a full chapter in the book that explains how to test um, this system. Uh, I will be covering part of that but um, only part, I won't be going over the, the entire thing. Okay, so any questions um, please leave a comment.